Hey, movie lovers, welcome back for another Anatomy of a Movie here at Popcorn Talk. Today, we go into the fantastic world of Jack Black. No, it's not Goosebumps. It's another one called The House with a Clock in Its Walls. What a tongue twister, at least for me. Stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Though it is September, it feels like October. <laughs> and so we're getting into the Halloween spirit with this movie. Uh, my name is Phil Svitek. I am joined alongside Marissa Serafini. Hello, everyone. Dimitri Panos. Hey, folks. Hey, panel. Hello. Hello, indeed. And hello to you, the fan, listening or watching. Either way, welcome here. Now, regardless of whether this is your first time ever or your second, third, fourth, fifth, and I'll keep going as long as you want me to keep going. Either way, welcome to the show. Um, for those uninitiated, though, understand that we do things a little bit differently. We're not just a review show, we're also a discussion show where we go in depth from how they wrote it, how production was made, and of course, culminating into the box office numbers and so forth. So from that perspective, this is your spoiler warning. Uh, if you would like to follow along with our discussion, we do have a rundown available to you. It's in the description box. Uh, this one is a zip file because it includes a couple of pictures for you to browse through as well. Uh, so especially if you're listening on audio, that way you don't feel uh, like you missed out on something. You know, the, the, vi the video audience gets to see the visuals right then and there, but the audio audience, you, you have not been forgotten. Uh, and last but not least, um, the, you know, where we like to start is with our overall impressions of the movie. So to kick us off, Marissa, what do you got? I thought this was a really fun film. I watched the trailer. I was like, yeah, Kate Blanchett sold. Um, and we've even talked to Owen Vercaro himself a couple of years ago when he was on our Mother's Day, uh, mm -hmm. that anatomy. Um, so I, you know, I was excited to see this film. It, it looked fun, magic. I'm, o I'm always there for the fun supernatural element of that kind of stuff. And uh, when watching it, going into the film, I didn't realize Eli Roth was the director, and I was a like, huge fan of Hemlock Grove. But if you know Eli Roth's work, it's very bloody, it's very gory, it's very scary. And I was like, wait, he did a kids film, <laughs> so I wasn't prepared to see so much scary stuff in this film and i'm not a scary person I'm like i i don't like horror in that sense um overall it was fun but way more scary than you think that they let on in the trailer all right dimitri what about you uh, i was looking forward to the movie uh it, it was obviously it was meant to be a throwback to those amblin movies of the 90s the late 80s and 90s and for the most part i enjoyed it uh, it, it for me it was very uneven, and the third act to me sort of kind of went a little haywire. Everything from like it was your your main baddie, uh, your super bad was like a Bond villain. Like the motivation was very like take over the world kind of thing, which sort of surprised me a bit. And then there were some you know baby Jack Black. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm not sure I needed to see that. Uh, and then I just found the pacing to be a little bit uneven, but there were many parts that worked. And to be honest, I think one of the parts that worked spectacularly was Jack Black and Kate Blanchett together. I mm -hmm. felt that they really helped carry this movie with their banter. They pulled it off naturally, and I did enjoy the kid. I thought the kid was very, I thought the kid was really good too. I, was, I enjoyed the premise from which this was, and I did really enjoy like that 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 small town atmosphere that mm -hmm. again, growing up, watching movies like Gremlins and even Poltergeist, where you where you get to see the town and almost know the people. Um, I enjoyed that aspect, but like I said, I found uh, the the latter half of the movie was a little bit uh, uh, uneven, and it could have been probably tightened up a little bit. It delivered some scares, uh, but nothing over the top. I felt it was. Uh, I, th I felt it could have been a, a really, really good Halloween movie for kids. Uh, it ended up being okay. Yeah, I I, I sort of agree <clears throat> overall with that sentiment. Uh, I I was looking forward to it, kind of being kind of like a companion to Goosebumps. I did enjoy Goosebumps overall, uh, the movie. 
not necessarily the, not talking about the TV show. Not that the TV show doesn't have merit, but um, neither here nor there. Anyway, uh, I I like the setup and things like that. Um, and overall, yeah, it just something felt a little bit missing. Um, you know, it felt maybe just a little bit too long, especially if you're gonna do a kids movie. I think maybe an hour and a half would have sufficed. The book itself is quite short too, uh, so I'm surprised. You know, maybe maybe they could have truncated it. Uh, uh, from I haven't read the book, but from what I understand, it's pretty sort of spot on. Just not as much. Um, th- this one's perhaps a little bit more quote joyous rather than gothic in terms mm-hmm. of look, and that's what people are citing as a major difference. But as far as plot, it's overall the same. Right. Okay. From what I understand. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's sort of kick things off. Uh, I have never heard of this book before, but apparently a lot of people did. <laughs> I've never heard people. of it either. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either, and I was even more shocked to realize, come to learn, it's twelve book series, mm-hmm. and yeah. then it started in the seventies. That's what I was growing up like. I would have like this is the kind of book I would have loved as a kid. Yeah, they had really bad publicity back then. I mean, because I, I I literally had never heard of the book, and I didn't know it was a book. Uh, like even after I had seen the, tr- I didn't know this was based off of like a book. It seemed yeah. like a good original movie. And from what yes. from, from what I'm understanding, like I don't know, I, I, <sighs> bookstores that I've been to, like it's not usually if if a book gets turned into a movie, all of a sudden like it's everywhere. I'm right. not really seeing the book. Um, kind of advertised, yeah. uh, which is interesting. But it is by uh, John Belairs. Uh, it is 1973. This this came out, um, and the writer Eric uh, Kripke, who has done uh, Supernatural. You're a fan of Supernatural, Absolutely. but um, you know he was a big fan and wanted to do it. Um, now I want to ask you this. Supernatural I don't go... is a very scary show too. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go too far off subject, but he says uh, in that show in particular he lays in Easter eggs. Um, based on his love of this, in hindsight, is that evident for either one of you? I mean, had I known, I might have looked, but like, I it's they were so far removed from me, and Supernatural is going on to its what fourteenth, fifteenth season right now. Yeah, there's no <laughs> way I could be able to it do one movie. Started in two thousand five. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, there is. I mean, I, without reading the books. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to. It, yeah, I really can't. Well, I just wanted to set you, set you up with an impossible task. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> so. Supernatural. And, I, and and the thing is, too, with Supernatural is um, Bradley Fisher and James Vanderbilt of Mythology Entertainment are big, were really big fans of Eric Kripke. And they knew that he was a fan of this book. And that's why they approached him to say, hey, if you could do any project you want, like, what would it be? They're sort of lobbing, lobbing him a beach ball. And he's like, "House of the Clock and its Walls, of course." And that, that the book he said, uh, Kripke being, influenced him so much that uh, it was the, the the one and only time he had ever written a fan letter. And of course, this is a guy that gets a ton of them now in his career. And he wrote it to the author, and the author wrote him back, and he says, "I still have that letter." Yeah. So uh, it was one fan letter that started this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now. Maybe you guys can answer this because I, I couldn't find this in particular. But um, did he intend it to be a PG movie from the get go? Because I wasn't uh, that part of it. I couldn't um, find as to who made that decision. PG as opposed to is something a little bit more darker. Like PG thirteen. Or... Yeah, I mean supernatural. You know, it's not like a kid show. Not to say that it's the most violent or gory, you know, scary thing on earth, but it's. It's scary enough. People like Supernatural is more geared towards the teenagers, so generally you can kind of get away with the PG-13 because that's the demographic that's watching. Uh, granted, the main child in this movie is not a teenager yet. He's still like only 12, so yeah, I think you have to gear towards more of a cut back version of Eli Roth. And like, I know he wanted to put way more scary stuff in it, he had to dial it back personally, just as a director, as a creative person, to get kids to watch this. Because if you think about it, pumpkins, they're fine. Kids love pumpkins. There are, you know, like, and kids love magic. So if you want to get the, the kid demographic, you got to make it fun. got to make it light. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, mean, the, the, I mean, it would have to be PG or PG-13. And, you know, it's funny that you say 
uh, about Eli Roth dialing back because that contradicts the story that Eli Roth has been going on about about his conversation with Steven Spielberg and Steven Spielberg goes go for it scare make it scary kids love scares and when you're going back to Amblin Entertainment uh, and what Spielberg had produced back then not even directed but produced when you look at movies like Gremlins and you look at movies like Poltergeist Poltergeist is a horror movie and that movie delivered scares right and that movie at the time uh, it was PG <clears throat> but <laughs> that movie today it's still really well done this is a little bit lighter fare and you know supernatural hell watching it on CW there, there are some stuff I go oh they got away with that <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's violent <laughs> um, this one the premiere is self is horrifying and um, here I felt that it went like it got dark and I know Eli Roth was pushing that envelope uh, I, personally I was a little bit surprised that you know, I don't know what deal they made with the MPAA, but it, it, PG-13 could have been. Mm -hmm. They could have gotten away with a PG-13. I don't know if parents were upset, like taking some of their younger kids to this film. I didn't go, notice I, it. So I went. I went Saturday, and we had. I, I don't know. I can't tell ages of kids anymore, it's nor tough. in this day and age do I even want to start to <laughs> guess. So funny. It's so true. Yeah, but I think, like, I, I don't know. I My guess, six-year-olds were watching this. They certainly acted like they were six. They were running around screaming, Daddy, popcorn. and Oh, no. <laughs> well, I went, I went on a Friday, and literally there was a child next to me under the age of 13. So okay. she, was, she was probably around 9, 10. And uh, she was in her mother's lap because she was so scared. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like they wanted to definitely gear towards kids, but they didn't give us a warning of how scary it was going to be for kids. It's, it, it's funny that you mentioned Goosebumps cause, because to me this sort of was like an R.L. Stein light. Yeah. It yeah. was definitely within that vein. And to your point about the Goosebumps movie, I didn't find this to be any less scary Mm -hmm. Than say that kind of a movie, so to speak, and it, which is fine. I actually think the Goosebumps movie was a little bit better as far as its 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 pacing and, and such. But it was it's definitely in that vein for yeah. sure. Well, this movie, I, I think it perhaps tries to be a, a little bit too much, especially kind of in the beginning. It's a lot of magic and fun, and then kind of we transition into the more horrific parts, uh, and. You know, I know, I know it's kind of going beat by beat, but so, some of the plots like kind of felt perhaps a little shoehorned in. In particular, with mm -hmm. uh, his relationship with the uh, the friend, the girl, right? Not not um, not the antagonist, not Tarby, but the uh, the little girl. You know, by the end, they're quote friends. And, uh, but I think it could have done without that whole subplot. Right. You know, not that it wouldn't, I mean, it's probably cuts out at best two minutes out of the movie, but it's just something more to think about that you don't need to. If, you know, and if I could throw in, because I would say I would have rather favored more of her in the movie and less of the Tarabee subplot, because that to me ended up just being a cliched subplot. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually thought they were going to be friends and remain friends. I didn't realize Tarby was going to be... Tarby. Tarby, he's going to turn into a jerk. Like a little... Yeah, and so... Right. Tarby that, was terrible. He was. He was. And yeah, well, the thing is, is that... Uh, like, they, they <clears throat> claim him out to be a friend. And really, he was just a long-running um, setup for just a getting hit in the face by basketball or whatever, or dodgeball, whatever it was. and But that didn't have a great payout. No, it, it didn't have a great payout because they never set him up to sort of kind of be an asshole to begin with. He's, he felt like an outsider because of his cast. Obviously, he looked like he was wearing the jeans and the white t-shirt. So he's sort of kind of like the tough kid. So you sort of felt that, at least the way I interpreted it, he was the outsider, you know, very much like Lewis was the outsider, right? So I understood their friendship and bond. But there was nothing. There was nothing where I where I go. Wait, well, where would this turn come from? What? And then the then the girl, she says, "Oh yeah, he does that. He, you know, he's great when he wants the votes, and then he gets the votes, and you know." And I thought that was even going to be a payoff. Uh, what was one of his campaign slogans? 
soda, soda from no all of And I thought with the magic, like he was going to go, oh, watch this. And soda was going to come through. So there wasn't that payoff for me. And I thought that they were going to be best buds. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have minded the girl being in it a little more, too, because she seems, quote unquote, gifted. You know, I, I would have rather well, they stayed with her because she seemed to be a more interesting character as the movie goes on. Well, this is going to be an exercise in theoretics. <laughs> of course. Well, only because, okay, so the book comes out in 1973, so some of the stuff that we're talking about, uh, per- perhaps in 1973, aren't as cliched yet. Uh, so it, it lends the question of, because all these things that we're talking about are there in the book, yes. right? His his turn from, e- to, you know, Tarby's turn from good to evil, quote-unquote, uh, the the girl and 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 their friendship at the end. All that is there, so in a sense, you kind of have to update it for for a newer audience. Or again, kind of posing a secondary question to that: if you're gonna have a PG movie for kids anyway, to them, they haven't seen that much, so cliche is not cliche. True. I don't know. Where do you guys stand on that? I mean, if you think about it, when you have the little kid Tarby and the little girl Rose, I believe, or Rose Rosa. Um, their character traits are someone that you would see back in the 70s even now like they were weird and eccentric enough to be considered outcasts um you know the outsiders the people looking outside from the inn and and i did love how like technology wasn't a part of this story it's like magic um so it just character development they seem like the their worst quality characters were something you'd actually see in real people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, number one, this movie is uh, a period piece. It takes place in the 50s, I believe, right? Post-World War Post-World II. Post-World War II. Uh, yes, you're right. Her name is Rose. Um, you know, I don't mind... Number one, when you're setting it in the 50s, uh, you know, when you make a really good movie, it doesn't matter. It, it becomes timeless, in a sense, right? So... You folks do a show uh, about film adaptations or books turned mm-hmm. into movies, right? Mm-hmm. So you see this all the time. I think you'll agree. I mean, you can update a story. You can just, you could have still kept it in the 50s, but just tweak it here and there, and you can make changes. I mean, they, 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 they make changes from those adaptations all the time. It, maybe it would have benefited. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, and again, I don't know how religious they were. To it, the source material, it seems like very much so. And I, and again, we at the top of the show. I grew up in the seventies. I had never heard of these books before, and I should have because this is the kind of stuff that I was watching at movies. Yeah, you know. So, well, what was interesting, you know, as far as Tarby, he's the one that in in the initially in class he says, you know, ah, come on, let him play. So he had that moment, and it wasn't necessarily followed up with like, "Hey, now, now that I picked you for the team, like you're gonna vote for me, right?" It, it didn't have that moment. So you thought perhaps he was different, but then of course there was definitely signs of like, "Okay, this this is a little scumbag kid," uh, definitely there. And really, all in all, what he served more for was kind of being the catalyst to to bring Izzard back from the dead. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Tarby was there to help constantly challenge Lewis to perfect his magic and even get like better and like okay I'm gonna prove this to you because he was always doing things so or Tarby was always like antagonizing Lewis just enough to keep Lewis doing more magic right which eventually led to the resurrection right just to prove himself and again to me that comes before that even all happened when 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 um when Lewis is being given the grand tour by by Jack Black, Jonathan, you know, and he, and then he he specifically stops and says, "I only have one rule: don't ever ever do this." And then you just know that that's the rule that's, that's gonna, gonna be break. broken. You're like, well, that's gonna be. <laughs> that, yeah, it's like okay, how? And then it was you know Tarby who, you know, well, instigated it. Yeah. For him to break that rule, but. Here's here's where it did get interesting because you have that aspect of it and you kind of go down that route and you're like, eh. <laughs> but the fact that he has, quote, the mother and she gives him very specific directions, the two directions, right. you know, the book and the key. And 
that is embodied within what he's not supposed to touch, then all of a sudden, I was torn equally like Lewis was torn of like, wait, what is the truth here? What is happening? Um, it's especially, you know, when you're a kid like that, like when your mother appears to you, right? you're, you're going to go with it. And this kind of bothered me in the sense that this seemed too easy to do for Owen. Like two kids managed to get the the key and the book within like 20 seconds and the mother it, it like it took more effort for the mother to change herself or change the shape figure get into the house and tell lewis to do something she could have already done and that bothered me it's like why why couldn't you have just done it yourself you're obviously a powerful witch yeah I, well for it's for me easy. the whole mother where it started off touching but then it just I was like, well, there's something wrong here. Like th- she's not who she's not who she claims to be. And here's where I thought I was thinking again, I was thinking more poltergeist. There's an evil spirit in the house that needs to get a hold of this to be to come to fully fruition. Mm-hmm. We've seen this trope before. And I was like, okay, this the mother's not who she seems to be. She's someone else that'll be it's gonna be revealed. Um you just knew that they were going to get this key, get this book, and do, you know, and, and then all hell breaks loose, literally. That's when the movie got sort of fun for me, mm-hmm. <laughs> too. Getting there and getting past it, I, I felt, I don't know, that's where the pacing was a little off. Well, if you kind of <clears> think <throat> about it, the, the coffin, like his rise, doesn't really happen until about the midway point, mm-hmm. which... In, it's kind of interesting because you think that should be kind of your almost inciting incident or you're you're taking off at 30 minutes in to the sure. movie. So, you know, if you think about it, the movie's, just, let's say, 140 minutes, give or take. Uh, so this is happening closer to, like, the 50-minute mark. Uh, that's, that's 20 extra minutes that they're just finding stuff. So, you know, that could be the cause of the pacing. It could be, yeah. Um, there was a lot of introduction, which I didn't mind because... I really did like the introduction of of Jonathan. Uh, Jack Black is Jonathan, and and Kate Blanchett as Florence. I enjoyed their introductions and the whole thing with is that a robe? It's a kimono. <laughs> you know, it was. I found that I found the banter. It was light. It was it was good. It was funny. And going into the pacing, though, I sat there going, "This movie is going to get supposed to get scary at some point." At some point, this is going to have to happen. It's in the trailers, I know. Um, but I still enjoyed the introduction of the, of the boy, his setup, why he's there. Jonathan and Florence, I think. Th- those three, I think they really make the movie, and I really love their... I, I love when they were together. Well, let me ask this. So, <clears throat> I like their introductions, and Marcy can speak to that. But then we got the introductions to all the magic, Right. And I think we only needed to introduce the main characters and the fact that they're a little bit magical. But then we set up all the rules of everything. Right. We the, the whole walkthrough and the whole teaching aspect of it, um, you know, seemed not all that fully necessary. And that's what dragged it down for me. I don't know, Marissa, do you agree or disagree? I mean, I liked the fact that he was a like a. I don't want to keep saying outcast, awkward kid, but he, he was a kid that really didn't have anything. He just lost his family, and he's he's lonely. He He's one of those sad, lonely kids right now. So I, I think the introduction to Magic is like, okay, this gave him a spark of life. It, it gave him something to like be happy and look forward to. So the whole process of learning Magic, that was, I felt, just a very long montage for kids to enjoy when you see like all the spells going awry or you know um the, the slapstick humor within the magic i actually didn't mind it because it was fun to watch we've, we've even seen harry potter gotta bring it up um we see spells going wrong all the time in harry potter and people love it so it makes sense that because he's such a novice that he would mess up a lot of magic mm-hmm. yeah i mean for me the, the what i found to be the most interesting aspect of the magic was that it wasn't as if you were either part of the wizarding world or a Jedi. That was something that was within you. Like Harry Potter has this this capability within him. The magic here was actual, seemed, was, was born of practical magic. 
practical card tricks, making things disappear. They were magic acts. And it seemed as if with the proper technique and study and practice that anybody can do it. Hit, they put their mind to it. Anybody was able to, to, to do this magic if they wanted to. And that's what I enjoyed about this because it wasn't... When you look at Harry Potter and even like, you know, a Star Wars movie, there's somewhat of an exclusion. You either have it within you to be a wizard or you don't. You know, not everybody can be a wizard. That's why there are muggles. You either can have the force, you're force sensitive, or you're not. Over here, it just seemed everybody was included. If they would, like even the little girl, she wanted to put her mind to it. And, and I, I'm only going to guess that in the other books that she becomes a magician as well mm -hmm. that you know and that's why i thought they were going to bring her in to maybe do that but that's one of the aspects of the magic in this movie that i appreciated because for any kid that's watching they could go i oh i could do that too i can make i can make a card disappear i could i can do magic mm -hmm. and i thought i thought that was a positive thing that the movie had to say well it's certainly one of the things that brought Jack Black and uh, Kate Blanchett to the to the roles because Jack Black always wanted to kind of be in a movie where there's magic and uh, and Kate Blanchett actually understood the book and wanted to be part of you know a film full of magic so the fact that it it just aligned perfectly for them mm -hmm. so you know certainly not going to take those aspects out mm -mm. Um, and you you know it it is fun but I would argue the only slight difference being that with Harry Potter. It had more of a purpose in those moments. You knew kind of where things were headed. Yeah. Versus this, you know, we're just we're just. What 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 I, what I didn't like about it is um, there were aspects we were learning where I knew okay we're setting this up very deliberately because it's going to come back at the end right. and it's going to need X amount of the, these magic to to pay it off later. Yeah. And it was very kind of like see this card because it's going to come back later. Right. And they even said, there was a line in the movie that says, well, you can only be a true mu uh, magician if you, if you kill, <laughs> and that's sort of dark, if you kill a bad wizard or something. Like there was something, and it, it had to do with killing somebody. <laughs> um, and that's when you were, but you did it on your own. Like you didn't have help. You were able to conjure the magic on your own to, to defeat evil or, or something to that effect. No. Yeah. That was very, yeah, very foreshadowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so That's you knew that the kid was going to be challenged in a way, and he was going to be on his own. So it was no big surprise when, you know, Kate Blanchett and, and Black were, like, mm -hmm. taken out of the equation. So, so to that point, uh, before we get into the finale, one of the things I want to talk about is the aspect of this f when, when he... When he releases um, Izzard, right? Isaac Izzard. <laughs> Always a... <laughs> what such tongue twisters with these? Interesting names, for yeah. sure. Well, Izzard like wizard. Izzard. Yeah. Like uh, Eddie Izzard. <laughs> anywho, uh, you know, this is a big point in the movie, and obviously it's something that uh, Jonathan very much dislikes and gets upset about. Uh, but then, Kate, and then uh, Florence kind of tapers him off and says, well, he's just a kid. From, from your perspective, like, the, he let out the darkness of the world. We're, we're you know, we're, we're in a apocalyptic, apocalyptic state. Right. Like, right. He's not just a kid. Like, he did something very bad. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, I, I love Florence for that because we get this mysterious backstory of her. Like, she is technically a mother, so that nurturing aspect came out. So uh, I right. loved how Florence did stick up for, for Lewis. But Lewis very well knew what he was doing. He was trying to he just prove his magic to the scumbag of Tarby. And, but they also, it is, like I say it both ways, it is on Florence and, and uh, Jonathan. Jonathan that they didn't fully inform Lewis of, like they gave like little hints of who Izzard was, but not fully informing, like if you read this book, which... He wasn't supposed to anyways. It would raise Izzard. So they didn't give him all the details of like who exactly he was resurrecting. So had Lewis had more information about what he was doing, he probably would not have done it. I don't disagree. And, you know, it, it's not... I under You understood where Florence and Jonathan were coming from, right? 
But it's not like he spilt a glass of milk. That's he just unleashed holy hell on the entire planet. By the way, I actually, uh, because we were talking about Izzard, uh, I just thought of an Easter, uh, the supernatural Easter egg. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. So, so in the movie, and, and here's the exposition that I thought was exposition I thought was sort of kind of cool was so um, you have you have Isaac Izzard, he's going to war, right, and he goes through a horrific experience. Now, these aren't the kind of things that are in family horror movies, but he he's the only survivor uh, of the, that took place at an attack. He's the only survivor of his battalion troop. And he's walking amongst the forest, and which is hell, basically. And he's shell shocked, and he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And he comes across a demon, you know. And this demon says, that "Demon is scary." Yeah, and 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 he makes a deal with the demon. Now, in Supernatural, I don't particularly remember which season it is, but 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 Dean uh, uh, is is actually cast in in hell or he's in the, and it's a forest mm -hmm. and he comes across a demon and they have to make a pact together because the only way that they can get out of this hell is for the both of them together to fight side by side and get the hell out of this quote unquote forest but dean is on this walkabout he's lost in this land they both come out later on uh this demon uh uh shows up in, in, in later episodes and there's a conflict of with Sam going Dean he's a demon we gotta kill him he's like well but he saved my life I gotta you know so there's that conflict there but that is an easter egg because they're both in the forest mm -hmm. they both they're both uh, anti-heroes who come across a demon and they make a bargain they make a pact with the devil so to speak fair enough Azriel or Azriel I think is the demon in this mm -hmm. in this movie but I like that um, you know, I just wished it didn't turn into, I'm going to take over the world and set it in my image. And I'm gonna, well, if you can turn back time. <laughs> yeah, well, quite literal, right? Literally. Um, but I, I did like the symbolism of a ticking clock. And I mean, when you, when you <clears throat> kind of talk about a countdown, yes. no mm -hmm. more literal way to do it than with a <laughs> clock counting down. So, so you get that aspect of it. Uh, speaking of the war, one of the things I do want to talk about is Florence uh, Mercy, who had mentioned kind of her family aspect, and uh, I, I appreciate that this was kind of brought in, and certainly like that history affected her magic and her ability to make magic, and uh, you know, really becomes an arc for her by the end when uh, I don't know, perhaps you can look at it like she realizes that she has a new family and she can honor her old. F you know, her passed away family with her new family. Right. And I just love Kate Blanchett so much and her character because she was awesome. And they kept alluding back to she used to be a mother. She used to have a husband and a daughter. And throughout the whole movie, I'm like, what the hell happened? Let me know. And they never really fully touched upon the exact details of how they died. Just the fact that they died. She's emotional. She She's not the same person that she was. Um, that's also just a running thing with magic. There, there's, like, so many different... Charmed is a big... I love Charmed. Charmed is one of my favorite shows. And they have this whole running theme of your, your powers and magic are tied to your emotions. Like, so if you're angry or something, your, your powers are going to be a little bit off. Or if you're sad in, in that respect. So it kind of ties to this when Florence, she's super sad. She can't perform the exact magic that she used to be able to or to the power that she could. Right. Um, and I liked how she finally did get to that moment of strength that she found herself again with the with this quote unquote new family but they they teased it so much of this her past i wanted to know more and they just did it yeah same here and and the other thing too is i wanted to have one of her chocolate chip cookies they looked really good. Delicious. <laughs> they looked. They looked really good. Wow. And, We're and, not and, preaching and, nutrition around here. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, to your point, I, I agree. It would have been nice to have a little bit more of of uh, a little more of that backstory, and and which would have been cool just to flush her out more. I'm sure in the books it's that way. And so, again, my. My guess is they were thinking we're going to make this movie. It's 12 books, so we at least have so many movies that we can make if this is successful, right? 
but put your eggs in this basket. Like, make the first movie, like, a really good movie. So maybe take some elements out of that second book or something. Put them in there so that our audiences really love the characters and understand their motivations. I know it's a kid's movie. They're not thinking motivations, but you still, you, right. you, you can make it for, kids can, kids love Harry Potter, right? But so don't adults. I mean, adults were reading these with the kids and they were going to the movies as well and they were enjoying it as much, if not more than their kids were too. So you can you could have done that here. But I when think. people died, you knew how they died. True. <laughs> It's like I just True. wanted a clear explanation of what happened to the family. Yeah. Was it a car crash? Did the husband get sick? Did the daughter get sick? It's like no, they're dead. I don't know. I want to just. How? I, I'm and perfectly fine with me. knowing that it just World War Two was that horrific. It was, yeah. Yes. And I don't. I, it I'm, affected I'm, many people many different ways, and according to the story, but according to life, right? Yeah. So I'm a person that doesn't need all the details sometimes. Uh, but speaking of another thing I, I didn't quite need, and we'll, we'll fully break down like the, the last act, let's say, because there's a lot to talk about with visual effects and practical <laughs> effects. But from a story perspective, I want to talk about the clock um, when they go into it. I really didn't need a Jack Black baby. No. No. That was no. – if there's – you guys are talking about the horror of it. I, I knew it was a kid's movie. They were never going to have like that many jump cuts. The baby scared me. I was the baby jumped out of my seat. It, it was horrific. It but, was quite horrifying. But not in the. It was like, oh, oh, jeez, I cannot unsee that right now. Oh, of course he's peeing. I'm like, oh, good oh, that god, that was just so much. <laughs> the pee. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I was like, so not necessary. It wasn't. It wasn't necessary. I mean, like we got a baby Ryan Reynolds. In Deadpool 2, which was not needed, but it got a good last. We did not need a baby Jack Black in this movie. This was more horrific than baby Deadpool to me. Yeah. Like, way more horrific. Like, it was just like, it, it it looked unnatural. And it just was, it was one of those. Disturbing. It, disturbing's a good word, too. It, <laughs> it really was. And I was just like, oh, good. No, get it off screen. No, stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> that aside, here's the thing, like I, I, I think they were just trying to throw in some laugh, especially with the P. But it took away from for me the heroism, uh, the whole idea of you know he's his favorite character and um, and having this kind of conviction to continue on despite you know your your scaredness, and he trumps over evil essentially. Yes. Know? And it took away that moment for me. It took away from the stakes. It, it did. And I can understand you, in a way, you, we had to have Lewis be the hero of the scene. He's the one Absolutely. who has to do the magic to overcome everything. And so that means you, you do have to take Jonathan out in some sense. Just knock his character out. Like, say he got hit in the head and then he's passed out. So it forces Lewis to do everything on his own. You don't have to turn him into a baby. And you can him. turn him it, into a baby. You but could. just leave him as a baby. Yeah, sure. not as they did. But, like, and I, I get it that they just had to get Jonathan, like, in some form where he was helpless, where it right. forced Lewis to be, to do the magic. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was very disturbing, and that was the most horrific part of the, the this movie for me. And right, to, I, I think we all agree it because you're focused so much on that, you're you're neglecting the stakes, yeah. and that to me is a, it's a mister it's a bad misdirect because the stakes are the world you know the time and time is rolling backwards, the world and everybody on it is in jeopardy. And they took time to show like various parts of the town and people disappearing and whatnot, and yet that we got baby Jonathan, and it's like oh, that's all you can think about, and you forget what the stakes really are, and that and that was a practical effect, and I believe that's also uh, a big part of the book as well. So you know, I don't know. Uh, there could have been another way to achieve baby Jonathan. Yes. Well. So let's 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 start to break down the actual science of a lot of this stuff. <laughs> um, one of the quotes from Eli Roth was, "When you don't have a lot of money, it can be a great thing uh, because it it forces you to be creative." He cites Get Out in particular, that sunken place scene. They didn't have a lot of money, and now it's a very iconic scene, right? 
Uh, so, so he appreciates that. He also cites that as far as visual effects, you want to be very particular. Ex Machina and Arrival are two movies that he absolutely loves, and they have a very specific uh, direction with the visual effects rather than... Uh, he he takes a knock at Marvel movies <laughs> and says, you know, that they, they're just shooting all this stuff and sometimes it doesn't always quite come together. So, um, you know, I thought I thought from a visual perspective, they pulled it off quite well. And uh, where would you guys like to start? The automatons, the, the, the pumpkins, or the clocks? I was going to say the automatons were scary. Sure. Um, and there were so many shots of them, and those you can definitely tell were practical. You just the way you film it make them look scary make them look big and overbearing and that the devil one that was like moving around like that that <laughs> probably scared me the most and they kept cutting to that I was like I get, yeah, it. That, I get it that one reminded me of the twilight zone <laughs> um, uh, the, like the devil and the atomic yes they, they, they were creepy and I remember um Atom, I can't even say that word right now. Atom, Atom. Atom. They a were puppet also a puppet. <laughs> the, the, pu- the metal puppets. They were also a big part, part in Hugo. Mm-hmm. If yes. you remember that movie, they weren't oh, quite I as scary. Hugo. Yeah, loved Hugo. Um, so, But in this movie, too, a really cool fact about them is many of them are actually from Steven Spielberg's, uh, where he collects these things. And <clears throat> they, again, a lot of them looked like they were from various television episodes that I remember growing up as a kid. But they're really creepy and scary, um, uh, um, too. I love the visuals. Look, visualistically, I thought that the movie just captured it, mm-hmm. right? And it really it felt, not just because of the pumpkins, but it, it felt like a good Halloween kind of movie. That, that could be released this time of year. So I like the visuals of the pumpkins and, the, you know, the the clock itself didn't really fit in with the chills that the uh, that the metal puppets gave and and the pumpkins, but everything really looked good. I felt one of the one of the aspects when you talk about uh, practical effects. <clears throat> we, what an exciting day and age we live in! Like some of this was created. They're like. We have a 3D printer. Sometimes it's easy to run it through the 3D printer and just call it done. Sure. <laughs> and I found that to be quite interesting. You know, this is not a technique that you could do even just a few years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's fantastic to kind of hear and, and have it all come together. But um, let's talk about the, uh, the, the pumpkins, right? Um, from, from a visual perspective, like they wanted them to almost be kind of snake-like, hence why they have right. like the little head arm or whatever you want yeah, to call it <laughs> yeah um mercy you want to kind of give us the the backstory of everything uh well the the whole lore of pumpkins is that they're supposed to ward away evil and i think it's interesting with the contextualization of the pumpkins in this they actually became you know, like they they were so good at their job that they were warding off good not evil <laughs> And they they just looked a little bit more scary than you would expect for for pumpkins. And I I think it was actually um, an interesting adaptation of what kids and adults know what pumpkins turn out to be. Yeah, I mean I liked the pumpkins. I liked how they were turned by Izzard, and I liked how they became these evil these evil things. I love the designs. Uh, the carvings of the pumpkins were really cool. The flickering of the light. I mean, I carve one or two pumpkins for Halloween every year myself. Um, I really like that. And and they were used in this movie to good effect. Um, it, it gave me a flash uh, back to, uh, to, to a movie called Trick or Treat, <clears throat> which one of the vignettes, uh, or the short stories in that movie, was about pumpkins and collecting pumpkins and, and things. And they each had all these crazy designs. And I, I like that. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas pumpkins play a part in the opening song as they're lanced on on, on, on metal gates, iron, yeah, gates yeah, iron gates, right? So pumpkins and Halloween just go together, even more so than pumpkin spice latte. I mean, yeah. pumpkins and Halloween go together and you can create a pumpkin today. It can be creepy or it can be happy. It can be yeah, anything awesome. you almost want. There's but like I pumpkin love pumpkin carving design. Yeah. Right and I love the designs because they were 
creepy scary. It's what Halloween's about. It well, was the, cool. This was one of the moments where Spielberg said, go for it. Yeah. And, uh, and they were able to take it a little bit further than perhaps they initially even would have. And that's what I appreciated about it as far as the pumpkin scenes. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things as far as um, the hardest one, uh, kind of just in hearing the, the various quotes from everyone, was the actual clock room. Right. Because when you have to create this, like on the surface level, you want you you obviously need it to work. But if you're gonna, the more realistic you make it, the more dangerous it is to be on it. <laughs> uh, so they had to come up with all these various ways to uh, protocols and safeties. Like for example, the small gears. If someone like landed with a foot in there, it automatically stopped, even at the slightest like notion Pressure. of it. Yeah. Right. Um, for some of the bigger gears, they had safety. Um, on and off switches right next to it and, and various things. So, um, But that seemed to be the most difficult thing that they had to put together. And I liked it. They actually used it into great effect because we see so many different versions of clocks in this Absolutely. movie. Absolutely. Little ones, big grandfather clocks. Um, like You see all different sizes, and then when you make a human life form size of a clock, it would be scary to get caught in sure. the gears. And I think they definitely use that to a good effect of gears. Getting trapped in it, no one would want to get trapped in gears. No, it, so I think it was very well done. Yeah, and again, it, re- it reminded me of Hugo. Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that, that that's a movie, uh, you know, a, a, a clock with a boy in its wall. <laughs> because, you know, that that relied on him being in the clocks within that train station. Well, the train station. And... Um, but here I felt that it was it was nicely realized. Uh, I, I believed it. It was a really grand scale of things. And it felt that people had to, they were climbing, trying to stay on. And it was, it was above more mere, like, scaffolding. Mm-hmm. You know, it was something that was alive uh, within itself. It was, a, it was a character. Much like the house was a character in this movie. Well, that, that that is a good point because they they do cite that everything in the house had to feel alive and be believable, and which was in the details. I mean, you you of course had the lazy boy, and they very much purposefully made it to be out like a dog. Um, all the mirrors turn into monitors, and the, you know X, Y, and Z. The lion. The lion. The lion. <laughs> um, that was fun. I, I did like the house because it is magic. It reminded me of Beauty. And the Beast. In the Beast for you know, like, yeah. you know, all the enchanted Absolutely. objects, which were fun, and they added to this story. They added to the scenes. My favorite was the stained glass windows. <laughs> like I really enjoyed how they did that, and that, and that to me, anyways, was a nod to another speed Steven Spielberg produced movie uh, called The Young Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, I've seen it. Terrifying. So, um, <laughs> and uh, Richard Donner film. And um, a little bit of trivia. Chris Cullen. The the um, uh, the stained glass knight that jumps from the window onto the ground. That was the very first uh, time CGI was used in a movie. Was within that, and this to me I saw is playing an homage to that. I loved how they. <laughs> it wasn't that they, the figures in there just changed position. The whole thing changed. Like it was a different landscape picture. Um, I love like the rolling sea, and then the kid looked back. Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> I really liked how they did that. That was really fun. It was nice. Well, that that was the catalyst. It it literally wrote to him like, "Don't leave." <laughs> Don't leave. <laughs> or whatever. Paraphrasing, of course, but. Yeah. Um, and also, the, it, it showed like the the stained glass window and the objects. They knew. They, they always knew more information than the audience did. They knew what was up. They knew something was looming, and th- there were sounds. And um, you, you can tell when the objects were scared. That that told the audience, hey, something scary is about to happen. They Because, essentially, animals always know before the humans. They were kind of like the animals right. in this movie. For sure. Right. Um, so lots, lots of fun stuff there. Um, it all came together quite well. Um, from... My sort of research, about 800 visual effects shots, but all, again, very deliberately, not just like, okay, let's let's just green screen everything. No. What we can have is practical. We'll do as practical, and if we can expand it from there, that's what we're going to do. It, you know, from, from a budgetary standpoint, the movie cost $42 million, right? I mean, 
it could have been a hell of a with forty two million dollars. They actually did pretty well, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you would say, I would say, hey, folks, take a look at what they were able to accomplish with forty two because they, for this kind of a movie, they they did a lot. They really stretched out their dollars and that budget pretty well because you know, had I not read it myself, I would have figured this movie was eighty to a hundred maybe. Mm -hmm. But they really utilized the, the the visual effects and utilizing practical with CG. Mm -hmm. I think kudos. Absolutely. It didn't look cheap. I'll just say that. Right. No, not at all. It looked very colorful. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, you know, for a kids' <clears throat> movie, I, I don't. Again, the, kind of I mentioned that at the top, but the book is a lot more gothic, and there's illustrations, things like that. But um, this this is a lot more cheerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe you know. So, so I appreciate that aspect yeah. of it. Even just the wardrobe, right? Um, Florence's wardrobe, the, the purple. It's just very, it pops. Yeah, it was, it, and that was very H.P. Lovecraft, um, costume designer Marlene Stewart. Um, yeah, that's what she used as an inspiration for the purple. And, and she showed some, 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 some pictures to Eli Roth. They were on the same page. I thought Kate Blanchett and the purple. I mean, I remember when she looked great. I, and I said it already, but they really did it no disservice. Right here in this poster, she does not look great. She doesn't even look like Kate Blanchett. I mean, they did no disservice. Like, they did a major disservice to her. When in the movie, she looked like her costuming was great. Um, her her wand or walking stick with the per I mean, the, everything about that character was so meticulously put together that it matched the character's personality. And, um, yeah, I, found, I thought she was, I, I thought it was great. I, I thought uh, the way that she was costumed, uh, she looked great. Jack Black, I felt, too, is Jonathan looked really cool and great with his kimono. And, uh, and little Lewis, even with his goggles. I felt I felt the costuming, it didn't fit the fifties, and it felt a little goth when you when you look about it, everything was tied up, especially with Cape Blanchett. But the kid with his goggles, a little steampunkish here, I really thought it really lent to the atmosphere of the movie. Absolutely, I hundred percent agree. And <clears throat> kudos to uh, Owen. Um, you know, we've seen him in Mother's Day. Uh, I liked him in Daddy's Home, and it's good to see him kind of... In Daddy's Home, he's kind of not as courageous, and it's good to see him go from, from a scaredy cat in this mo movie a little bit to to having some oomph. Oomph, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Marissa, I want you to talk about the sound, because uh, Nathan Barr is the composer on this, and you've gotten a chance to interact with him. Yeah, in the past. Nathan Barr has been in on here, so plug to our on the fly filmmaking show. Uh, he he came in for a very in depth interview, but he's actually worked with Eli Roth on just about everything that, that they've collaborated multiple times from Hostel to Hemlock Grove, which is one of my favorite shows. So, and of, of course, Eli brought um, Nathan Barr on, but for this. For this show, or sorry, um, for this movie, that they they actually recorded with a eleven piece brass ensemble, and uh, there, there was a, a whole orchestra that they recorded in sound sound stage for this um, big epic, uh, and it definitely encompassed like that gothic noir feel, just a little bit. It, it sounded like a good. Horror, not not your traditional horror theme, but it fit for like this type of, for lack of a better word, like family horror. It really lent to the atmosphere yeah. that they yeah. were trying to, that they were shooting for, and I think it really helped. Yeah, I, I establishing. Remember, right. I remember in particular the music when they're going to the cemetery, and you know he's following the compass. Um, it's not the most creepy. It's not like watching the nun in that cemetery scene. Uh, if for those right. of you who've seen it, versus versus something like this, this is a little yes. more kid friendly. So it's got a, a, a creepiness to it, but not over the top of like, okay, in two minutes there's gonna be poopy in my pants. <laughs> right, keeping um, it PG. 
And uh, the, they also used a 34 string ensemble, so lots of violins, lots of cellos, which can emit very scary, uh, scary eerie sounds when you go high or low. Um, and I feel that they use that a lot in this film, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, the other thing uh, that I do want to talk about that's music-related ties into the promotion. Uh, you had mentioned it. You, you had announced to our fans, for those of them that watch every single week re- religiously, that uh, to go see this in IMAX because I had to. Uh, they would get the Michael Jackson thriller remastered 3d edition yeah celebrating its 35th anniversary um so i'm curious for those of you tuning in at the moment how many of you did have a chance to do that how many of you took advantage of that um and if you did what was the experience like i'm very curious to to hear each of your perspectives because that's doesn't doesn't happen often (laughs) it doesn't happen often i purposely selected the theater that i went to number one they had okay let me go back a bit. Uh, they had announced that they were going to be releasing Thriller in IMAX screens in 3D. Um, but they didn't say how. They just said they were going to be announcing it. So They made an announcement to announce it. <laughs> well, yeah, they made an announcement. Well, yeah, they, it's, we're going to release this in theaters for Fair a limited enough. time. So I was like, okay, I'm in. You know, I, w- I would go. I, I wanted to see it. They didn't announce that it was going to be on the head of a movie. Um, and, it, and it turned out to be this um, a house with a clock in its wall. So when I went, I specifically went to go see this in IMAX. And for me, I, I mean, I remember when the Thriller video had come out and John Landis had directed. Um, and he had his cast of characters and behind the scenes people work on it. He had finished An American Werewolf in London. So Rick Baker had done the special effects on this. And it it was just a piece, it's just a mini video that just took the, it was amazing what he was able to accomplish, Michael Jackson that is. And this is like, you know, he'd had um, uh, Beat It, what Scorsese had done. So he was, he was making this, this, he was revolutionizing video at the time. And this movie, and this in particular was horror. So I'm all in anyways, but you realize First off, Michael Jackson, not the best actor, but as a performer, he was fantastic. Anytime it came when there was, when the, when, the, when this music video turns into like the dancing and the singing, the charisma, 3D or not, was going to leap off screen. And it was so pristine. And you just remember, like, it just brought me back to MTV where they were literally. Every day they would map out a schedule. This is at this time, this time, and this time throughout the day, we're going to show the entire, we're going to show Thriller in its entirety because they did cut it down for like a three minute video. And watching it again and seeing the talent involved and seeing it on the big screen, there's even a, there was a button in the video and there's a button and it's still there, but in 3D, I swear to God, everybody in my theater jumped jumped because the 3d really worked the 3d brought this to life in a way that we couldn't have had in the 80s when this came out i really thought that this was something special the audience was clapping like along with the music not like applauding after i thought it was a really special occasion to get to see this landmark video made um and if you want trivia, I mean, for the MTV Video Music Awards, when they were actually about Video Music Awards, this this video lost. Hmm. And who did it lose to? Does anybody know? That I don't. It know. lost to the cars, you might think. <laughs> so, and I was like, wow, that's crazy that, that that thriller lost to that. But the cars, you might think, was also innovative. But this video, if you're a horror fan and it was around Halloween, oh, and Vincent Price's Ova Voice. Fantastic. So you enjoyed it. Oh, I, I love it. I, I, you didn't go see it this way? I told I you. Ch- I know. I didn't get a Burbank. chance. Burbank. <laughs> it, it was awesome. Um, but thank you. No, that, that is, um, I think it is interesting. Uh, I, I wish they did do a version where you could go see it without kind of shoehorning it as part of this, um, you know. But, but I get thematically that there's 
somewhat tied together, so I'm not going to knock it. This for takes that. place in the 50s, the, the, the yeah. thriller, and you know, but the choreography and the dance and the music itself and just the direction and the story it has a story. It's got every element. There's a haunted house. We'll do Doesn't a, have a clock we'll, in the walls, but we'll have to do a whole anatomy just on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, as far as promotion um, for this, uh, you know, I thought I thought that they promoted it quite well overall. Um, speaking of fun facts and trivia, Marissa, you you made light of uh, kimono. Kimono. That's, <laughs> that's how it was shipped to the theaters. Yep, uh, under the 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 code name kimono, and that's also in the trailer too. So, which that's probably one of the the first laughs you get in the trailers. Mm-hmm. So, which already is promoting that this is comedic and fun and light for the kids. Absolutely, and uh, you know, for Eli Roth, this became his number one opening movie. It debuted at twenty six point nine million, finishing first at the box office. Uh, so kudos to him on every level. Um, you know, and we we spoke about it uh, when you have a production budget forty two million. Uh, I don't know what, as far as advertising and all that, but um, you but know. also to I'm mean, like that is good for him to you know break a personal record. But if you think about it, this film arguably has a way more recognizable cast. Than all of his other films, I dare you to name any actor from Hostel or whatever. The or, Hostel like, itself, in, or Green Boom. Inferno, or like they have. Bruce Willis. They, they have recognizable actors, like you have Cate yeah. Blanchett, Academy Award winner. You have Jack Black, who's done so much, and even Owen Vicar is, is making big movies now. Sure. So like he has recognizable names that helped get people to watch this film. And I think the PG aspect, I think it's it's not just going to be America. It's going to be more worldwide. I think this, you know, it has an appeal, I think. Yeah, I mean, from, you know, currently anyways, I mean, for, for, from a foreign aspect, it's, it's made over nine, just a little over $9 million internationally. So you have a worldwide gross of, of over just over $40 million. Uh, it, it'll have some playability, I think, as time goes on. I mean... Rotten Tomatoes, I believe, the last I checked was 66%. Yeah. And I believe it got a B plus on Cinema Score. Um, so I, I think kids are liking it maybe a little bit more than the parents. And as usual, the parents are probably thinking it's probably too scary. And they, I'm sure somebody's complaining to somebody about it. Um, you know, for, for, for Eli, it being his first PG movie. Um, you know he's still able to dis- to deliver some scares uh, to an extent, and it was it was interesting because he had to rehone his talent and ma- you know it's he's not making a gory movie outside of the fact of pumpkins yeah. yakking on people in, in little baby Jack Black peeing, but um, yeah I, I think from all around it'll look it may not reach a hundred million all in right but i think from a halloween perspective they've just added a new movie for the season that people will go to on either streaming and or a physical blu-ray dvd type of a copy for the kids to watch at home there's a rewatchability factor with this i can see kids watching this over and over and over again. Same here. Yeah. And especially, the, I, I know I uh, knocked it a little bit, but as you made mention, the earlier scenes with the magic, I think that's, yeah. you know, when, when you have slapstick, it always works. And mm-hmm. as much as we're knocking the Jack Black peeing, I think kids, <laughs> that's it's a fun that. little moment. You, you know, you talk about fart jokes. Well, uh, I, I, a little kid peeing is not that far off from that as far as a universal chuckle. Yeah, it's new Halloween viewing for families, I think, and for and for kids. That's basically it. So, yeah. um, it'll continue to live on. Absolutely. So, well, speaking of that, uh, who knows if this will live on uh, as far as sequels? We'll see if this does well. I, I, I it would have to imagine. <laughs> We've got more coming. We've got twelve books. Harry Potter had seven, and we got eight movies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you know what? <laughs> good point. R- ride that train. <laughs> Let's keep them coming, baby. That's a good point. You know, so, hey. Um, all right, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap this up? Overall, fun. It is a fun film for the family, for the kids. Uh, but be wary because it is scary. 
<laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's scary enough. I think uh, one, one other one other little uh, Easter egg that's in the movie uh, is uh, that the, the the little town theater was called the Alamo. And it's named after uh, I know it's Eli. One of Eli Roth's favorite theaters, the Alamo Draft House. Um, but I think that this this tries to recapture the essence of movies like Gremlins and The Goonies and those types of Spielberg produced movies that had thrills in them and chills and, and kids liked them. Um, Gremlins is a pretty dark movie when you when you watch it and it delivers some scares and, and like you know when Stripe comes into Stripe's pretty badass and it's pretty horrific so this movie wanted to recapture that I applaud the effort albeit it's not a perfect movie I think the aforementioned movies are better but for this generation it works and it gives the kids um, something scary to watch during this awesome Halloween season absolutely I concur as well uh, I I'm curious to kind of rewatch it again, just just enjoy it perhaps a little bit more uh, now that I know the entire plot, and kind of see where it goes from there. Anyway, thank you guys for joining us. If you have any thoughts and opinions, which I can't imagine you don't, <laughs> let us know. There's a comment section for you to fill out. Just ba 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 type on your keyboard, type on your phone, whatever the case may be. Tablet, I don't know. Maybe you have a head device that types for you. Who day and age, day and age people. <laughs> Um, if you want to interact with us more directly, of course, you can uh, tweet or Instagram us or whatever uh, at Serafini TV for Marissa. That's right. At DMovie1701 with, for Dimitri. Tweet me. Support me on the tweeters. <laughs> and I'm at Phil C Tech. And of course, we are at the Popcorn Talk uh, for the network. And for some Halloween fun, feel free to check out our past movies. And speaking of moving forward, though, we're gonna we're gonna have Hellfest next week for you. As well as Halloween. Well, that's not next week. <laughs> oh, well, well, well. Life itself. Life, life itself. itself. See, well. there you go. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have life itself before Halloween, but oh yes, <laughs> down the life line itself. we will have Halloween. So lots to look forward to. Lots in our rearview mirror. All I'm saying, basically, keep tuning back in for the one. If you've seen a movie and you really enjoy it and you want to get more coverage on it, we're probably talking about it here. And keep going to the movies. That's right. Bye. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of its owners or principals.